Thank you for taking the time to watch this rebroadcast of an interview with Life's Journey founder, Chris Shea. For more information about Life's Journey, check out our website at www.lifesjourneyblog.com. We hope you enjoyed the interview. Conversation and discuss a few different topics. We've talked about mindfulness and we've talked about a few different things. And I think we're going to try to get started about every two weeks at right. the same time, like Thursday at about eight o'clock. And to let you know a little bit about me, I'll do a, a little brief introduction and then Chris will do a little brief introduction. I do a podcast twice a week called Spark My Muse on I tunes and at sparkmymuse.com and actually today tonight released at about eight o'clock i usually release on fridays but i'm releasing it a little early so that's a little little tidbit for you if you want to hear it later on maybe after this broadcast and then chris just started a podcast up uh yes. unbeknownst to me uh, but he's got some got some stuff rolling in for that you can talk a little bit about that chris Yes, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, Chris Shea, and you can find me over at my website, uh, lifesjourneyblog.com. And I've been uh, blogging for a while and uh, somewhat new to Blab and you know, appreciate uh, us doing these talks every couple of weeks. And uh, yes, I, I recently started a uh, podcast, so we'll see how this goes. And uh, it's called On Finding Peace. And uh, you can find that over at uh, SoundCloud and uh, Spreaker. Uh, and i am got some feelers out for some other outlets. Uh, not yet on iTunes, but hoping to get it over there. So uh, you can get the links over at my website. Good. Yeah. And so if any of you have... Um also have already have found your calling or know what your vocation is or interested to hear from you. I didn't realize we have a commercial from a secret Santa, but <laughs> you never know exactly who you're going to let in sometimes when people pop in. But, a um, commercial from secret Santa. Yeah, I didn't know exactly where that was going, but at least it didn't end up being pornography. So I guess we dodged a bullet on that one. <laughs> you never know. Um, but um, yeah, so so maybe, Chris, you can get started. I'm kind of interested to hear because I know you were in ministry for a while. And did you feel personally that you felt a call to ministry? Because vocation means uh, to call. And it's from mm -hmm. that Latin, you know, to call. And we think of vocal cords or, you know, things right. that have to do with voice or to hear a call. Did that happen for you? It, it did. And, uh, yeah, I kind of uh, look at my life in a few different segments. I, I mm -hmm. kind of call them past lives, although I've been alive for all of these past lives. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, I, I do uh, like the way that you put that, you know, that we do need to, you know, I think remind people when we talk vocation, we really are talking about what is the calling. And I think that so many people are uh, so um, unhappy with what mm -hmm. they do uh, because I don't know how many people view their life as a calling. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I'm glad we're doing this topic so that, uh, you know, and hopefully we can get some other people to, you know, jump in and really talk about how do we find that calling. But for me, you know, when I got into uh, active ministry, uh, that really was what I felt called to do. And it's really hard to describe how do you know that you have a calling? You know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't hear any voices that said, this is what I want you to do. And, and that would have been wonderful. Um, that would have been that would have been a medication situation, possibly. <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> uh, Although it, it at least would have cleared some things up, you know, it's like, am I really supposed to go this way or am I supposed to go that way or what am I supposed to do here? Mm -hmm. And uh, but it really seemed as far as for me that the calling is when it gets reinforced by the feeling that it just is right, that there's a fit. Mm -hmm. So. You know, when we have a desire to go in one direction or to work with a certain group of people or a certain occupation, I think that if it fits, then that's really something that we can look 
uh, toward and say that, well, that must be my calling because, you know, this is something that uh, is fitting with what I'm doing. It feels right. It, it uh, It's not a job. You know, it, it's, it's not the burden. Uh, and that's actually changed for me a, a few times throughout my life. But, um, you know, I, for me, that that's how I, I look at it and how I've made those changes is, you know, what is feeling right? Where am I hopefully doing uh, the most good, the, the best ministry possible? Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah. And, and a calling doesn't have to be one thing for the whole rest of your life. And I think that's right. a misconception. Like, what do I have to decide to do for the rest of my life? You know, as if mm -hmm. it has to be just one thing. It can switch in different seasons of your life and different. Um, another thing that I think is a misconception about calling or vocation, sometimes those are interchangeable words, mm -hmm. is that it has to be something that you're paid to do. It could be something that you have a regular job and then it, it's something that you do that's a passion or that really right. is life-giving, but that you 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 fund that a different way and that it's a different kind of business model, if you will, or, or, um, you know, that you do and that there's no one right way to do it. You know, as long right. as that, that you find something that, you know, this is basically why I'm here on earth at this time to do that's meaningful mm -hmm. to me, um, that, that you find that way to do it and that you don't let someone push you around into thinking, oh, no, if you're not doing it this way, if it doesn't look like this path that I did or mm -hmm. this path that this other person did, that somehow you're doing it wrong. Um, I think that some people get a little bit bullied into right. it should kind of look like this path or you should go. You have to go to a divinity school or you have to go to a missionary track or, you you know, that there, it has to look mm -hmm. like a some certain path. Right. And I, I think that's really a false you know, a false premise. I, I agree. And, and part of that premise that you just talked about is one of the reasons why I, I kind of had my first transition in life, right from high school mm -hmm. into the ministry and then transition, uh, you know, into the counseling and continued from there that, um, you know, when people would ask me, well, you know, if this is your calling, then why would you leave that calling? You know, did, did you misread the calling? Mm -hmm. Uh, for the, you know, people in my circle who are, you know, religious and looking at the calling as, you know, from God, you know, well, did God make a mistake? Did I make a mistake? Am I making a mistake by shifting into something else? But I, I think that's the improper way of looking at it because that's boxing the vocation into just one way. And for me, you know, I don't know necessarily exactly what God would want for me to do, but I always figure that even if God has a plan for my life and I may have went in a different path, he's going to use what I'm doing as long as what I'm doing is positive and, and helpful to other people. Mm. But I also look at, you know, how do we know, you know, if we're following our calling Every time that I've shifted somewhere, I've, I've reflected backwards, and I really can see in hindsight, every place where I've been has built up to where I am at the time that I'm reflecting on it. So mm -hmm. when I'm reflecting where I am now, uh, you know, working in campus ministry in a high school and doing counseling and these podcasts and all that, if I look back uh, in the more than 20 years since I got out of you know school, that you can see now in hindsight that each step of the way prepared me for the next step, which has prepared me for where I am now. Yeah. You know, and and who knows where the future lies, but you know what is this preparing me for? But um, that that kind of solidifies it for me that you know maybe the paths that I have chosen really was following you know, a, a, a more of a divine led path, so to speak, because it all makes sense in hindsight, mm -hmm. you know, not at the time, but in <laughs> hindsight, it, it begins to make sense. Right. Right. And also seeing um, some people think of, oh, there's, a, there's right turns and there's wrong turns. 
and and think of thinking of things in terms of uh, like pass fail or you know oh, this was a failure or this was a and and I'm I'm thinking that those binary um, ways of looking at it aren't necessarily helpful either because um, you learn from every single place you've been mm. you know and and it might be this windy path but but since you've learned on that part it's not for nothing you know and uh, right I don't know that it that you would be the person that you are without going that way and even if and even if it was even a poor choice or even a sinful choice or something like that that you know yeah mm -hmm. maybe maybe i shouldn't have done that thing or, or whatever it was maybe a, a bad choice um just a less than good choice maybe even if it wasn't like out out and out sinful or whatever right. but it was just like yeah probably it probably shouldn't have done that that was probably a bad move but that it's still it still helps create who you are and that maybe you wouldn't even be been as been well prepared for right. where you are now at that point and i think that sometimes we i know for me anyway i wind up thinking binary like oh you know I, I guess that was a failure but really probably it wasn't because that prepares me in different ways that just success after success wouldn't have actually done mm -hmm. and and i think it's you know when i've worked with the clients and even within my own life that what i found is if it's a failure if we look at it as the failure that even if we took the wrong path, did the wrong thing or failed, you know, I mean, just yeah. outright failed at what we were doing. If we learn from it, you know, improve ourselves because of what we learned, um, become a better person because of it, then in my mind, it's not the failure mm -hmm. because we've actually learned a lesson and mm -hmm. we're taking that lesson with us. We're trying to be better people because of it. Mm. And in my mind, how is that a failure? If I'm growing, I didn't fail. Right. So, you know, I think if we, if we kind of wallow in those failures and, and we kind of just sit there and, you know, keep telling ourselves I'm a failure, I'm a failure. Well, yeah, you are, mm. you know, but what do you do with that? And, and that to me is, is one of the important aspects of it. Yeah, I think when I was I was considering one of the themes for for January that I'm going to be covering a lot in my podcast and a lot of other people who are doing this thing called Syn Create, which is S Y N, and then the word create just as one word. If you hashtag, if you use the hashtag, other people are going to be kind of working on some of these themes in different ways, whether it's writing things or doing photographs or videos or whatever. And I'm going to be covering it on my podcast throughout January. And one of the things I've been noticing as I kind of pour over it and think about it in, in deeper ways and and how I might um, consider it more in, in a few ways in the podcast is that when you're considering vocation for the long term, for years of work in your mm -hmm. life, that you really have to look back at the things that have brought you really intense um, joy, but at a really soul level that even when the work was, could be brutally hard and could be even traumatic and, mm -hmm. and terribly, and terribly hard, that there was some sustaining joy in it, that you would go back to it again and again, even maybe for very little or no pay, or maybe it was volunteer right. work. You know, I, I know a, a friend of mine would do hospice work, which was, which was volunteer work, mind you, you know, it's, <laughs> You have to get another job to do hospice work sometimes. <laughs> you have to think that is that is brutal work. But if you have a passion in your heart to be with someone at the most vulnerable time in their lives with their family at, at the time of death um, as rewarding work uh, and that's a passion for you, then you find ways to do that type of meaningful work. Let's, maybe we can let Van Gogh come in here. Oh, and, wonderful. Uh, let's see what happens has to say hey hello welcome hi there hello. welcome hey how are you do doing pretty good Great. have you uh, found your vocation in life oh yeah yeah um i've been a minister for 24 years and uh good I, I like these kind of blabs when you're talking about life path and uh had something interesting <coughs> happen uh, uh, something you guys might be interested in uh i was at a conference and uh, mm -hmm. I was praying, and I had to get this picture from my mother. Is uh, the Lord told me said find something where you were three years and younger, a picture. Mm -hmm. 
find what you're doing in that picture and see how it relates to the age you are now. Hmm. And in that picture, I was ministering to my great grandmother when I was two years old in the bed and I was, I had these animals and uh, I never left home without my animals. And so now when you fast forward it into the future, uh, I'm actually going into prisons and I'm teaching about how animals preach the gospel. And I started with hunt. I started with honeybees because they tell a very unique story. And uh, the second one now is the giraffe. And so it's getting very, very interesting. And uh, I'm from Tennessee and I have a goal to uh, go into uh, all the prisons and, uh, and uh, preach, preach to the captives. And uh, so it's, uh, but anyway, it's just a neat thing. So I've challenged 15 different people, my friends of mine, and all 15 of those looked and they found pictures of when they were three, eight, three years or younger. Okay. And uh, they were doing exactly what they were doing in the picture. Firemen, oh, policemen. Okay. It's been been very, very interesting. Uh, that, that is, uh, that's really fascinating. Um mm-hmm. You know, actually, I'm I'm also go once a week into federal prison do, doing ministry work as well, and um, it is really right. gratifying, really gratifying work. And um, it's it's Christian men. There actually are Christians, and um, they. It's hard for me to not go in over the holidays. We're not supposed to go in because they're they uh, it, their schedules are different now. And but it's the hardest time for them at this time of year because they're separated from their families, obviously, and. Um, yeah. And it's it's more difficult for them over the holidays. But then my heart kind of goes out to them because they're the most lonely during this time of the year. But um, the the one guy said to me um, because we're I was trying to get volunteers to come in from our church, and it's just hard because people are afraid often to go into prison because they think it's like Shawshank Redemption and they think it's going to be this horrible place, you know. And it's actually usually not that bad at all. And um, it's it's pretty you know it's patrolled and it's actually not that especially at the federal prison it's it's like a community college with bars usually and i and i said um they said why why won't why can't you get anyone to come in it says in the bible that you should visit us and i was like oh i know it does i know (laughs) i'm so sorry but um but thank you for for your ministry to them and that's that's a really that's a really neat thing i'm gonna actually look at some of my old pictures and see what I was doing. I was probably just messing uh, around. I don't know if I was yeah. doing anything worthwhile, but <laughs> I don't know if I have any pictures of. <laughs> yeah, but but it, it's fascinating though that you know you you can bring in something you know so totally different and and have that message of you know how the animals you know uh, can preach you know in, in that way and. And I, I would imagine that, you know, there'd be a lot of skepticism at first, but then they, they probably really get what you're doing and, and what you're saying probably more powerfully than if you just went in and said, all right, I'm going to go preach. Yeah, well, the the concept was so designed for prison, but I didn't see it coming. I was just invited to come and do it is I actually use a bookmark. And everything on that bookmark, everybody gets one, and at the end, it's perforated. So what I'm doing about honeybees, you win honey at the end of it, but you tear the bottom off. Well, what happened when I went to prison was I was using them as tickets. And I was telling these prisoners, I said, well, if you're going to go to church tonight, you got to have a ticket. And they said, we've got to have a ticket to go to church. I said, you do tonight. <laughs> and it created this, <laughs> what? I've got to have a ticket to go to church. And they absolutely loved it. But you could only take 20 prisoners at a time. And there's 1,200 in this one particular one. So it's going to mm. take, they're fixing to up it to 60. But uh, and that's just one uh, prison in Tennessee. So the next one we're going to is the ones where prisoners go to die. And wow. it's, the, it's the hospital prison. Mm-hmm. And he said mm-hmm. that, and the guy told me, he said, that way you can do Matthew 24 twice. You know, visit the sick and the prisoners. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, all I know is it's got God's hand on it, and uh, I, my phone—I've done it like everywhere but my church. I've been so busy going everywhere else, I <laughs> couldn't even do it at mine. So, uh, mm-hmm. but God's really on to something, and I'm finding out that every animal I've studied tells a story. Oh yeah, you know sure. I mean, and uh, so I ran into a, which is neat. I was telling this forest ranger about it. 
and this guy specializes in screech owls. And he started telling me about screech owls, and so one thing led to another. And so we're going to try to make a federation because there's no way you would have time to study all these animals. But he was talking about by the time this guy guy got done talking about screech, and it's the only owl that does it out of all the owls. Like they marry for life, and they build a nest. They got this courtship, but that's the only one you know one of the owls that does that does this. And so uh, he's on board with it. He's going to start mm-hmm. going into schools. So. Um, going to be very, very interesting to see how this shakes out. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. That's neat. Yeah. And it's also when you, one of the reasons you know it's a vocation is the the thing that happens between you and the other person because mm-hmm. that joy is so mutual back and forth that it's like it feeds, everybody gets fed in that interaction. And that's that's how you really know it's a vocation because it feels so good both to mm-hmm. both people that are interacting with that you're it, it's like something happens between the two of you that everybody everybody wins in a vocational th- situation and so when you give hope like that telling your stories about the animals mm-hmm. there it's just so mutually encouraging so that's probably how you knew you had landed on something because it was so well received and came it came back to bless you that's awesome. Now, now, where are you from? I'm in Pennsylvania. I'm in Pennsylvania. Are you a Steelers fan? You bet. You better. I couldn't be an I'm, Eagles fan. <laughs> exactly. I've been a Steelers, even though I'm from Tennessee, I've been a Steelers fan since I was a fetus. So, yeah. Oh, wow. That's pretty early. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, everybody likes the winners. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know I get a lot of grief. I'm I'm on the Eagles side of the state, oh, okay. so there's there's definitely some animosity going right. on around here. But I'm from Pittsburgh, so I, I would I would uh, be disowned if I if I didn't if I wasn't a Steeler fan. So yeah. we don't have to talk about the too, that too much. We might lose some people, but I'm in Maryland. That's, I know, that's a whole I know. Other issue. Yeah, this, this could get it could get ugly. So we won't we won't uh, we won't yeah, belabor yes. that that tribalism. But um, yeah. but, but I appreciate you talking about that and and uh, finding vocation and and landing on that because it it is a really it is a really cool thing when you find out um when when you find something that you know you love to do and people love that you do it Mm -hmm. it's a really a thing that's full of joy so thank you so Mm -hmm. much for sharing that yeah Yeah, that's great and and i really like you know how when we were talking about vocation that you know it's not even as much of what we do but how do we discover what that is and you know it's wonderful in that outside of the box thinking that you find you know that vocation in the old photograph and and you know have that insight to move that into what you're doing and you know so i think it's great and you know hopefully a a message out there you know for myself and for everyone else you know that really look outside of the box and, and how do we find uh what is our calling you know that it may not be the obvious thing in front of us, there might be something else that we're just not yet seeing. And, uh, you know, appreciate you coming on and, you know, would like to hear from others who are watching too, as to, you know, either type or, you know, come on and, and join us that, you know, how do you find what your calling is? Or, mm. you know, are you seeking, uh, you know, how to find what your calling is? Mm. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. All right, I'll pop you back out and see if anybody else right. has. Have a great night. Thank you so much. All right, thank, thank you. you. That was really cool. I would have not expected him to say, I uh, looked at a picture of myself as a three-year-old, but now I'm totally curious. I'm totally going to try to <laughs> see what photos I could come up with. But And I'm going to look at my kids' photos and and uh, and check that out just and follow up and see what happens. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. you know, it reminded me of um, somebody said something sort of similar to this too, um, to go back into your earliest memory that you've ever had, if you can possibly think of what that is. And they, it was a person who did a book about this and they went to all these like famous people and famous successful people and, and something like, like that. Um, this was ages ago that I heard this of all people, the, the, 
the person, one of the people they asked was Donald Trump of all people. Of course, now all you hear is Donald Trump every time, you know, exactly. in the news, right? But his earliest <laughs> so memory we're, was- we're talking about him too. <laughs> yeah. The early, his earliest memory was gluing blocks together, his brother's blocks together mm. and gluing them together, right? And um, building an empire essentially, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and and it was all these other people and, and all their other first memories and that these were the, happened to be these formative memories that actually do somewhat define them. And I'm like racking my brain, what's my earliest memory? And, and if you can actually find out what they are or ask someone what their very earliest memory is that they can think of, it usually is somewhat um, characteristic of their personality or, or their mm -hmm. worldview, which is, which is wild. Like I started asking some of my relatives what some of their earliest memories were not telling them that it was formative at all, or that it would, it would be somehow defining of them. And it right. was remarkable, like, um, you know, certain relatives that had really horrible first memories had had more, um, not maybe not sad lives, but like, worse outlooks on life. And it was actually, it was actually quite interesting. But in terms of vocation too, um, thinking about some of those earliest, um, some of those earliest influences, I know, um, like maybe parental influences or earliest teacher influences or coaches, mm -hmm. they have sometimes very big impacts on our lives that can determine or set us on a path toward vocation, or at least the the path that we might take towards something that we might later do. Right. Did anybody well, it, have an impact on, on your life in that way? Yeah. And, you know, it, just looking from a, a purely uh, psychological point of view, you know, most uh, developmental uh, psychologists will say that we have, you know, by about the age of five formed our personality. Oh, right. So, you know, it's interesting, you know, to look at it in this way, because it, when we talk about vocation and, and more so on, you know, that spiritual side, but yet the science really backs that up, mm. you know, to, you know, say that by then, you know, and, and you know, our, our guest showing, you know, that he saw something at age three, you know, and, uh, um, and, and I would probably say, you know, I don't know if there's any photographs, I'd, I'd have to take a look at me, but, um, I'm probably doing about what I would have back then. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I've always been focused into how best could I help. Uh, I've always wanted to be the helper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. when I look at the different ministries and jobs and even what I'm doing now seems to still uh, reflect that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that that's... That's an interesting, and the the counselor in me is is intrigued. Um, but do you do you know Lisa about your first memories? Are are you, are you kind of on that path, or my my first? I have extremely extremely early memories, um, so early that I I wonder if they're false memories um, because uh, I'm not sure if they're from pictures or not, um, right. like eight, eighteen month old memories and things like that. So I, I don't even know. Um, I was born in Puerto Rico and, and we moved to Pittsburgh when I was about four and a half. And okay. the cultural difference was so extreme that it, that separation made, made me almost like cemented in all these memories from when I was extremely young. And I, I don't know, I have loads and loads of memories. It, it's just really strange. Um, I, I think if you scan my brain, yeah, people would be like, <gasps> you know, I, I'm not sure. I don't even know, know what to say uh, about it. I, one of the things, though, when I was when I was thinking about vocation, I was thinking that it seems that people seem to spread into three main categories when they're thinking about what is most meaning for them, although it could be a combination. So it seems like people like you have a helps or service vocational bent to them. I, I really want to help or serve people. And mm -hmm. then there's the problem solvers. I really want to solve something, fix something, make something better and, and you know, make something, solve a problem. There's the, that vocational bent that a lot of people have mm -hmm. that just makes it feel so good. And then there's also, uh, I want to make a real difference in the world. I want to I make a, an influence or a difference in the world. It seems like those 
and there might be more than three categories. But as I was thinking, it kind of breaks down into those main three, sometimes a combination of those three. And for me, I think it's, for, if I can think of an, at an early age, the one for me is that I want to make, I want to be an, an influence and a difference maker. Okay. And being, an, being the oldest child, I wasn't like um, influential in my family, being, being the oldest, the responsible, you know, had to kind of head up my brother and sister and had to watch them from an early age and make sure I was the bossy one. You know, I had to, you know, they would tell me that. So they, they would not be shy in telling you that was the bossy one. And so I think I kind of felt that it was kind of my job to um, just, you know, kind of be the person who was going to um, help them along, I guess mm -hmm. you could say in, in those ways and not in, not in the helps and service way, although that's, that plays into it, but in, in the sense of, can I be an, an influence on them? And so I think in terms of vocationally in graduate school doing spiritual formation, it was, it was for my own benefit, but it was almost like, can people transform? Like, is it possible? How does it happen? It's for me, but it's for other people. Like, can people get better? Can people change? How mm. does it happen? Can I help them do that? You know, so it's like, so, so I don't know. I, I have to probably dig around a little bit and see, you know, how did those early influences happen? And having a, having a father who was a minister mm. and who was a coach, a, a lot, a lot of athletics and coaching and extremely influential on my life. So it was from that kind of coaching background, a lot of athletic, a lot of athleticism, and I was a big into sports. And so that was kind of the mindset in my family. It was a lot of like um, improve, get yourself better, you know. Um, right. And, and so that, that was kind of the culture sort of in my family. So I think I just, I don't know if it could have been another way. I was just kind of going to go, <laughs> you know, it was just kind of going to happen. You, like You were that. stuck. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. You know, there's like a, you know, like the uh, French French drainage system. You 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 carve out like it doesn't. You just carve it out, and the water just goes that way. You don't mm -hmm. really it doesn't really have a choice. It's like that's kind of how it feels like it might have been. But, um, you know, I I don't totally know. I would have to. It, it feels like uh, forensics at this point. I don't really, <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> oh, it, it, it seems to I, I think make a little more sense than maybe your. Uh giving it credit, but, uh, but I, I like what you say in, in, you know, the sense, you know, when we look at, um, you know, especially from, you know, the spiritual side, you know, can people improve, can people change? And you no, know, that's, I, I think one of the things that led me on a spiritual journey, one of the things that has led me into the counseling realm is that sense of hope that, mm -hmm. you know, to me that that's what a spiritual life is all about you know and and uh it it is about you know nobody is perfect but where is that hope and when you read scriptures uh, of practically any of the you know religions that there's always that sense that there is a redemption there is a hope this isn't the end and what I really like, you know, when you look at some of the, uh, you know, people with, who were especially early uh, in, in religions and, you know, especially with Christianity, you know, which uh, is mine, that most of them were very flawed people yeah. and probably the worst people to be representatives, you know, of any organization, uh, let alone, you know, a, a major, what becomes a, a major religion, but yet it happened. Yeah. You know, and, and when, you know, I, I look at, you know, Christianity and all the different, uh, you know, segments of Christianity around the world and, you know, to think that, an organization that has lasted that long with so much turmoil and so much uh, division and, and just a, a varied history of, of sometimes evil people leading, uh, yet it's still around and still 
effective and, and still giving hope to so many people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's kind of what works for me when you look at what I do. You, you have to remember, I have to remember that there's hope and mm -hmm. we're flawed people. Mm -hmm. Not as an excuse, we just are. Right. Yeah, it's it's actually not the um, it's not the flaws and the evilness and the bad parts that surprise me. It's actually the good parts that do that hmm. um, in, in the sense of I know that people are going to wind up. Um, you know, I think it's C.S. Lewis that talks about being surprised by joy. Hmm. You know, it, it, in, in his atheism, you know, he was he he was raised a little bit in, um, you know, Anglican Right. didn't really didn't really care went went full out atheist and and was unrepentant atheist he couldn't stand christianity and mm. was very proud to be an atheist for a long time and was actually was it was joy that surprised him back into maybe you know being okay with being a little bit of a theist you know and kind of being like well maybe yeah. it was because it was joy that there was too much to account for in the world and too much beauty and joy that it sort of had to point off the map to something else going on that that was just too much to account for and mm -hmm. and i think that i kind of get that too because i can understand that there's enough chaos and that there's enough problems to account for the bad and the evil and people choosing their own of their own will to do bad things and to do things out of selfish intent it's the good parts that are right. like oh, okay so let's see what we got here we got a speaker coach galen let's yes. see galen let's see what welcome. Uh, welcome welcome galen good evening how you guys doing good doing well join the found your vocation yeah yeah i i um i don't know if i've found it or if it has found me <laughs> but uh yeah yeah i think mm -hmm. I, have. I think i have Very good. Uh, I how have, did it happen I, I am not sure you know it's kind of like <laughs> when, you, when you're walking down the street and you get something on your shoe and you're like how in the world is that <laughs> I, I am absolutely committed to this to this um i've got a passion for helping uh motivated leaders accelerate their their success and performance uh i am just absolutely convinced that every success and every failure begins and ends with leadership. And mm -hmm. my, my job, my purpose, the reason that uh, God put uh, all of the strengths and weaknesses that I have into one person is so that I can help um, leaders do that, um, become more effective and, and uh, embrace this responsibility that they have uh, to help other people be successful in whatever it is they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. that's Great. wonderful yeah. and then you um you find people and you mentor them and things like that yeah you know so i do um i do executive coaching uh i do uh mentoring uh i do leadership talks uh i was uh convinced that i needed to stop selling books for simon sinek and malcolm gladwell uh and uh write my own books i've written two books so that i'm uh, I'm, I'm uh, kind of doing my own thing there. And like I said, this is this is a passion uh, uh, that I have. I think my life would actually be a lot more sane if, if this weren't <laughs> my passion, but it is. <laughs> well, who is well, it? And, you know, that's kind of a point in, in the sense that, you know, I think people, we, we can really see that it's our calling when either, as you had just said, you know, happens or, you know, when somebody sits back and says, you know, like, I would never imagine me doing this or being able to actually have the skill to do this, and yet I'm doing it, you know, and, and that to me is, is one of those, you know, vocations that, you know, I think finds you and, and if we're open to, uh, you know, things like that, then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll find out that we can do things that we never imagined, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that we could ever do. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I, I've found, and maybe this is a, a, a new component of my passion, uh, I've found that a lot of times people don't achieve um, their goals or their dreams or they don't find their vocation because of fear. And mm -hmm. um, fear is um, a, 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 temp, a, a tempting sed seductress that, mm -hmm. that draws everyone back into being mediocre. 
Uh, I don't think mm. that uh, I don't think that people were designed to be mediocre. Uh, I think that we were all designed to be the greatest in the world at something, and then your life's journey is to find that thing. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Very, I agree. Very nicely said. <laughs> yeah, and so who was an influence on you to help you decide uh, to help you kind of move in a direction of vocation or? Uh, gosh, to move in direction of vocation, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, my my story was that, you know, or my story is, uh, I've spent uh, over twenty five years in corporate America, working for some of the largest uh, corporations in the United States, and um, just became really friends with my pastor. Uh, you know, beyond just being a member of the church. And, you know, he was, he seemed to be struggling with some leadership issues some some leadership elements in his church, uh, as a lot of pastors, uh, pastors do. And so I just said, hey, look, would it, would it help you if I came to one of your meetings and just shared what I know about leadership? Uh, and he said, yes, I mm -hmm. came, I talked for an hour. Uh, they seem to be getting a lot out of it. I was getting a lot out of it. Um, mm -hmm. And that turned into, could you come back? And I came back you know, three more times and we just did some more of the same thing. Uh, I went to church after all of that. And my pastor turned my leadership, my leadership message into a sermon. Nice. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh. And it really just kind of mushroomed uh, uh, from there where, uh, you know, I was doing things for other pastors and other churches and, and giving these leadership talks just because I enjoyed doing it and it seemed to be making a difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, I, at the time I was uh, always using uh, material from other authors that I have, uh, that I respect, you know, Simon Sinek, Malcolm Gladwell, Jim Collins, all these guys that I just really, really respect. Mm -hmm. And so finally a friend of mine sat in on one of my talks and said, you know, Galen, uh, I could tell that you get into this, you're doing a great job. People seem to get a lot out of it when are you going to stop selling books for all these other folks and, and do something for yourself? So, uh, oh like I said, this, this, this thing has found me, uh, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I'm having fun. I lose track of time when I'm doing it. <laughs> That's uh, a good and sign. so, yeah. you know, Marcus, Marcus Buckingham, uh, talks about, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Marcus Buckingham. Mm -hmm. He talks about, um, strengths. He's very big into strengths management. And he says that a strength is something that um that yeah you do you do it well but when you do it you're actually strengthened from the activity and you mm -hmm. can't wait to do it again and that a weakness is not necessarily just something that you don't do well but it's something that um whether you do it well or not it actually weakens you and you hope oh. that you hope that people never ever ask you to do it again <laughs> uh and so um i am just really really strengthened about uh, strengthened by helping leaders be more effective, mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, lead, by by being a leader, uh, not necessarily talking about leading a, a massive group of people. Um, you know, you could be a leader uh, even if the only person who's following is you. Mm -hmm. uh, but that comes from finding who you are, why you're mm -hmm. here, and what are you here to do. Mm -hmm. um, which is very similar to the title of your blab. So I'm a, very good. Galen, leave right. your link in the, leave it. I'd like to follow up with what you're doing. Leave your website in the messages and, and we'll follow up with what some of your stuff and, and uh, that'd be, that'd be mm -hmm. really cool. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm pretty Absolutely. Very good. All right. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, to get to one of these questions over here, that was really cool. And uh, I yeah, think what he said it's about great that people are joining in. Yeah, absolutely. The thing about weakness and strength that's really neat too. It's kind of like what my spiritual director was telling me when you're in your strength, it's like that flow that happens. It's like it's like total ease and and you don't notice time and it's just it, you're just in the flow and it's easy. And the weakness, I think, when he talks about feeling weaker, that's something that someone else is good at that's in their flow that you can actually mm -hmm. delegate or outsource to them that's in their mm -hmm. in their flow and it helps them out and it's kind of like in in christianity the body of christ every every member has a has a part to play and you don't have to do everything yourself um exactly alex 
has a has a question here that's really interesting. Yes. Can you define love and what and at what point do you start loving yourself? That's just an excellent question, Alex. Do you want to tackle that, Chris? I want to just throw it on <laughs> you. I, I'll take a shot at it too. I might have to think about it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah I. I, I love the question that that could be a, a whole blab topic. I need to itself. come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I did a uh, write back and, and the, the only thing that popped in, into my head at, at the time and uh, you know, we could look at uh you know, comments is uh, I wrote back to him an intense, undescribable feeling of peace with who I am at this moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for me, the important part of, of that actually in, in uh, the writing of that is, you know, who I am at this moment, mm. uh, you know, kind of goes back to my focus of mindfulness and, and staying in the present moment. But, mm. you know, do I like who I am or accept who I am right now? Mm. And I think in that acceptance of who I am, that doesn't mean I'm perfect, but even accepting those imperfections and trying to find those ways of, uh, you know, what do I need to do in the next moment to maybe work on those imperfections? Right. But uh, it, it's it's more of acceptance, I, I guess, as I'm talking it out too. You know, Alex, it, it really, um, I'm. That's a very provocative question that I do actually would like to actually explore in another blab, but um, mm-hmm. because it is so, there are so many layers to it, and it would be really cool to explore it more. I think what what even to look a little bit past the question about why it might even be asked, because I've asked the question myself, and I know why I might even ask the question, is that I have I've asked that question. And I'm not saying that this is why you asked it, but I've asked the question because I have felt that it's been so hard to love myself because I have really struggled personally with um, with self-loathing and or or the opposite. What happens for me is is self-loathing and then over to like arrogance and, and ego egocentric. So it's kind of like, mm. you know, seesaw, woo, you know, I, I feel <laughs> real not good enough about myself. And then, oh, I'm, I'm kind of awesome. I t- I'm too awesome. You know, um, and so it's kind of I'll kind of wind up doing that. And, and that's happened forever. And I think it's because uh, I mean, I could go. I'm not going to get into all the reasons why and all, all the crazy reasons why uh, my upbringing might have contributed to some of that. Um, that would be for my memoir or something someday. Um, but one of the things that let us know when it comes out. Yeah, I, I don't know. That might be really boring reading. But um, <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that really helped me is to start to think of myself. And this has actually happened a little more recently than I would care to admit that I've start, started to see this in a new way that has really helped me kind of strip it down to think of who I am really. And one of the things that I, I kind of stumbled on, um, because my my background is, is a Christian background, but this actually comes from a little bit more of a, a Buddhist tradition, but it actually doesn't doesn't really collide and and destroy Christianity in any way. It actually kind of works with it. Um, is to see that the thing that I didn't don't like about myself is actually a construct that isn't really my true self. And so if you think about um, who you really are, who are you really, that part of you that you are really is never unlovable because that is sourced in God who made you, right? And so if you believe in a creator God who made you where you come from, and when when you die, you go back to the source, you know, rocket ship back to the source or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. If you if that is what you believe, and um, I don't know, I don't know what your beliefs are, um, but if if that is what you believe, uh, then you can't. Um, you know, to not to not love yourself is to not love this creator, right? And so you, so anything else that's around that isn't part of that true source. And so you come to love yourself because you are actually loving that source and anything that's Mm -hmm. added to that can kind of fall away. Right. And so I know maybe that's going to sound a little woo woo and a little, a little weird, but that, 
what what you're actually loving is love is God it, itself, and you are, and then, you know, it, it's kind of so if you have trouble loving yourself, what really helps is worship, right? Not worshiping yourself, but that you worship <clears throat> God, right? You worship God, and then in worshiping God, you realize that God loves you, and you love God, and it kind of bounces back and forth, and you realize that God's love for you. Is, is like it's mirroring back and forth. And I don't know if that's going to help you at all, but in the process of how, how do you define love and how do you start loving yourself? I think that really helps if you have something outside yourself to love, something mm -hmm. that is this objective thing. That's why I would be such a bad atheist. But I have to tell you, I, I've been talking <laughs> to atheists and, and there's, there's things that, that I'm like, oh, that, that's... You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm been, I've been talking to. So Jennifer Michael Hecht is my my atheist guest on the Spark My Muse podcast. She's an intriguing mm -hmm. woman, she's a fascinating philosopher, and I, I'm totally, I, I, I am totally girl crushing on Jennifer Michael Hecht. I think she's <laughs> the, such a fascinating mind. I really love her poetry, but the thing I can't, I can't wrap my brain around is that I have to have something to have gratitude toward that isn't mm -hmm. myself. It can't end with me, right? And so that's right. that's where my love goes. It and it can't end with me cuz it it doesn't work for me. So, I don't mm -hmm. know, Alex. I I might not be the best. I might not be the best. Uh, I have no reason to hope. Yeah. I I am not the best end beginning and end for my love. But if if my love is put elsewhere on a good and holy God, uh, that is a good start, <laughs> but if it begins and ends with me, I, I wind up coming to a, a dead end really quickly. And so I don't know if that will help you, but um, I don't know, do you, Chris, do you know any resources that might be good for Alex to, that might help with things he could read in, in that in that vein at all? Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything. Um I know when we get off of this, it's going to pop in my head. <laughs> oh, I know, and almost anything by... Um, Henri Nouwen or Henry Nouwen. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, now I'm going to totally draw a blank. But if you go to <laughs> Alex, if you're still with us, I'm not sure if you're still here. Um, if you go to sparkmymuse.com and you look up Henry Nouwen or Henri Nouwen is really the way to say it, I have a bunch of his books listed on my website. And he's one of the mo most. Um, beautiful writers in terms of of having the struggle of of self-love and mm -hmm. coming to see god which is coming to see god as someone who loves him which is then coming to see yourself as loved and then being able to love yourself it's it's all connected and yeah. when you work that out um it it works because what happens is we tend to see god <clears throat> almost always we tend to see god as somebody we have projected a parent or an authority figure onto. And so then it, if it's, if it hasn't worked out well, it means that we somehow don't feel loved. It just, it's like this parental thing happens and we, we wrongly um, attribute God's love to us in a way that isn't mm -hmm. very well done, you know? And, and so, I mean, that's just a kind of a human thing that happens. It's not like anything you've done wrong or I've done wrong we just kind of wind up messing that up. Right. Um, well, and I really like what you were saying in, in, you know, that sense about, you know, love and, and the love has to lead us out to something greater than us, because if that does end with us, begin and end with us, then we're just talking about selfishness, you know, and, and that's where it goes back to, you know, my notion of what I was talking about earlier of hope. You know that that there has to be hope, and and hope is is definitely going to be greater than me. Uh, you know, because if it does just end with me, not only can it come into a selfish nature, but where is the hope? You know, so at the times that I'm lost, and if it begins and ends with me, and I'm lost, then I'm perpetually lost. I mean, how do you get out of being lost if you don't have hope of finding your way out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this has been this is uh, more than we bargained for with vocation. <laughs> so let's see. I see a message down here. Let's see if I can get to it. Uh, 
Let's see. Reason to hope. Once where hope is gone, it's life. Yeah. This has been a really, really cool bunch of comments and some really mm-hmm. great people popping in. I see it's already after nine, too. I don't know if there's anything else we should do to wrap up. Usually we, we finish up at nine. Yep. Um, and um, usually for everybody who's still here, it looks like we have a, even more than when we started. Usually we try to meet uh, twice a month, usually on Thursdays at eight o'clock. Mm-hmm. So you can keep your your eyes perked up for links on Twitter for meeting up again for discussions. And we usually try to keep them. They're kind of uh, not your typical run of the mill blab discussions about um, making a million dollars or <laughs> or how to use blab to promote your how to how to use blab to make other blabs or i don't know what what's on blab but these are a little bit different kind of blab discussions and usually we have really great people who come on and uh and say and say really fascinating things and so really appreciative Mm -hmm. for you guys to all watch and and um journey along with us so if there's anything else we should say before we sign off I don't know that this went into so much depth and, and spiritual sense. I, I, I love it. And, and what was, you know, really great, uh, you know, on this is that participation. You know, I, I think, uh, mm-hmm. since we've been doing this, that this, uh, I think is the most we've had, uh, mm-hmm. outside participation. And, and for me, that's what it's all about. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's not that I have the answers and I'm telling everybody, this is how you do it. I, I really do want to learn. Uh, you know, I can talk about my life and my experience, but I really want to learn uh, from everyone else and what is their experience. And, uh, you know, so hopefully I can grow from that. Uh, but yeah, I, I do encourage everyone that, you know, if these are the topics that all of you enjoy, uh, you know, please share with, you know, your social media friends and, you know, encourage them to uh, find us every couple weeks. And, uh, you know, if anybody has some topics, you know, feel free to contact us and you know, we'll see what we can do. But uh, I, this has been wonderful as always. Yeah, very good. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye bye, everybody. Have a great night and Merry Christmas. I don't think we'll see you till next year, probably. So Merry probably Christmas not. and Happy so, New Year. Yep. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And the same to everybody uh, out there. Very good. Good night, everybody. Night.